um, and welcome to our second FaceTime uh, presentation. We're so excited to have our speaker here today and all of you guys. It worked really, really well last time having you um, chat in questions and um, raising your hand for questions. So we'll do that. I didn't set up the poll everywhere this time because the, uh, the chat and the raise your hand functions worked so well. Uh, so hopefully you won't mind with you when you send me a chat or a chat to everyone that uh, I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask your own question. So, so our speaker today is Mike Gathright. Mike has a degree in finance from Baylor and an MBA from SMU. Uh, he began his career with Capital One and then moved on to Amazon and worked in customer service and global support for Amazon for several years. And he has spent almost the last six years with Hilton, uh, first as a senior vice president in reservations and customer care. Okay. And uh, moving into the role he has now. Um, yeah, I have to do anything. I, I'm just with camera off. I need you to mute muted anyways. Justin mute. Yeah, I already got in. I'm already Justin muted mute. and stuff, so I don't really care. Mike, can you mute him? Oh, I'm well. flexible. <laughs> Justin, you need to mute. We can hear you. All right. Um, he spent. Um, he worked in as a senior vice president in reservations and customer care at the Hilton, and is now um, senior vice president of customer channels, which he will explain to us. Um, he serves on the board as a board member for the National Organization on Disability. So if y'all will, please welcome Mike Gathright and I'll hand it over. Great. Thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to, to be with each of you today. We were just sort of commenting uh, before uh, we started and before everybody joined. Um, I, I know this is such a, a different time for everyone. Um, it was just uh, about a year ago that I was actually in the classroom uh, with uh, the, the prior group of students and really enjoyed being back on Baylor campus and, and being back in the B school. Um, and, uh, and so again, uh, look forward to spending a little bit of time today with you guys. Uh, obviously, in the hotel industry, uh, we've been uh, very disrupted uh, by everything that's going on uh, with uh, the, the pandemic in the U.S. I'll talk a little bit about um, just sort of uh, my background and you know sort of my career um, in, in a, a very quick synopsis. I'll talk a little bit about Hilton, just in general, non you know sort of pandemic related. Uh, for those of you that may be starting to think about different careers and and um, you know put a little bit of context of that, and then I'll clearly talk a little bit about the pandemic and uh, some of my thoughts on leadership as it uh, relates to that. And I really look forward to answering what questions you have. Um, feel free to if you have questions along the way to ask them or. Uh, at the end, we'll free up time uh, to ask questions there as well. So um, uh, hopping into it, uh, uh, you know, as just a, you know, kind of quick background, um, a little bit about myself. Uh, as uh, Professor mentioned, I, I um, grew up in Arkansas, um, graduated high school there, went to Baylor for undergrad. And when I um, came out of Baylor, I joined Capital One. Uh, actually, that started as a uh, sort of mock and practice interview. They came on campus um, to, to do some uh, practice and mock interviews. And through the discussion with them, really um, found an interest in them. At the time, Capital One was just a year old company. They had just spun off from Signet Bank. They were um, sort of this startup mentality and, uh, and were growing an operation in Dallas. And so had an opportunity to join them. And really what I thought would be maybe a year or two that would get me to Dallas, um, you know, get me started. And I ended up spending 13 uh, years with Capital One. Uh, it was um, a great opportunity, a company that was growing tremendously at the time. I did everything from credit card to auto finance to mortgage lending uh, as a final role there. And just really what I had I'd learned during my time at Baylor, and I'd, I'd done a number of internships, um, including with investment banking and, and with a senator one summer. And, and uh, what I'd learned was that the part of finance that I really enjoyed was um, more on the people side um, and, and interacting and leading teams. And Capital One gave me that opportunity out of the gate and, and again, spent 13 years there. Um, I, I used to say the, the, the worst crisis I'd ever been through was the financial crisis um, of 07, 08, and 09. 
that was before this pandemic. Um, this now makes all of that look like it was, uh, you know, a big non-event. Uh, but during that time period, uh, there was, you know, a, a really a lot happening with, um, you know, the, the financial meltdown. Um, and at that point, uh, the the financial world had become less fun, um, quite honestly. And uh, I, I made the decision uh, at that point in time to leave Capital One. I actually spent a year with my family. Uh, Amy, my wife, also graduated from Baylor. And we had two small kids at the time. We actually spent a year traveling. So you'll sort of see the the, the travel uh, I, you know, icon there, we, we took a, a year doing a sabbatical um, and uh, what now would be called a gap year. Um, I don't think we had that term yet uh, when we did this, uh, but uh, we, we took some time and, and traveled all through Europe and Asia uh, and Australia and then came back. And that's when I joined Amazon. At that point, um, we had sold our house, we'd put everything in storage. So we were sort of free to go wherever the wind took us. Um, and uh, had a colleague that I'd worked with at, at uh, Capital One that had joined Amazon. And so away we went, uh, moved to Seattle and, and uh, joined Amazon at a time when it was going through really hyper growth. Uh, the the uh, movement from really being an online bookstore to a, the everything store, um, the digital products of Kindle and Fire and, and um, uh, you know, the, the various devices that uh, they began to sell. And at the time was leading um, all of customer service for the Americas. And so really learned a lot uh, there around, you know, uh, customer centricity, thinking long-term um, and, uh, you know, many of the uh, messages that, uh, that Jeff continues to talk about today and that continues to make Amazon um, the success that it is. And uh, ultimately, uh, just, just over five years ago, um, got a call to, uh, to join Hilton and uh, really a great opportunity to help lead through some transformation, especially on technology and sort of customer that they were going through. And really an opportunity to take a lot of what I had learned through my time at Capital One, as well as my time at Amazon and bring that to the hospitality industry. Um, obviously nobody anticipated the pandemic and a time that hospitality would be brought uh, down uh, to levels, you know, never seen before in, in our hundred year history at Hilton. Um, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit about that as time. Um, as a Victor show, and I mentioned, uh, my wife Amy and I have been uh, married for 22 years. Um, we met at Baylor, uh, started dating there. We went our separate ways for a little bit and, uh, and then reunited and, uh, and got engaged and got married. We've got a, a daughter, um, Abby, who's a junior at Frisco High School in the, in the Frisco, Texas, the Dallas area. Um, and uh, she's all into dance and on the drill team. And then my son, Austin, who's a freshman at Frisco High uh, this year and is into sports, um, primarily baseball, and uh, just made his high school baseball team. So he's pumped about that. And uh, they're excited uh, getting back to face-to-face -face classes uh, for the first time this week. So that's a little about me and, uh, and my background and, and you know, sort of a, a quick summary of some of the journey that I've been on since I, I left Baylor, um, which, which you know, I, I continue to you know, say really helped prepare me well um, uh, for, uh, for the world that, uh, that existed post Baylor. To talk a little bit about, um, about Hilton and the numbers on the left hand are updated. The numbers on the right are, are back from uh, middle of last year. Uh, most of you have probably heard of Hilton. Um, you've likely heard of some of our brands, um, such as Hampton or maybe Hilton Garden Inn. Uh, but we actually have 18 brands, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. Um, we have just under a million rooms around the globe. We've got uh, now over 6,200 properties in 118 um, countries and territories around the world. Uh, and we have just over 100 million um, honors members uh, that are that are part of um, the honors uh, Hilton Honors loyalty program. Um, we are one of the largest, uh, you know, hospitality companies, and we really, you know, have a couple of um, key strategic, you know, focus areas. If I talk a little bit about our brands, as I mentioned, we have 18 brands. Um, that range the full spectrum. Um, six different brand categories focus on luxury and lifestyle brands you may have heard, such as the Waldorf Astoria um, or maybe Conrad brand. Some of our newer brands, Canopy and, and LXR in that luxury and lifestyle space. In the full service, um, Hilton, Curio, Doubletree, you may have stayed and, and had a warm chocolate chip cookie upon check-in. Uh, some of our newest um, hotels, Tapestry and Signia Hilton. 
Uh, in the focus service, again, uh, Hilton Garden Inn and Hampton have been around uh, for a while and, and you may have experienced or stayed there. Our newest brand that's one of our fastest growing brands is True by Hilton. Our all suites category, um, Embassy Suites, Homewood Suites, uh, again, brands that have been around a while. Our newest um, brand, although it's now almost five years old, Home 2, uh, Suites by Hilton. And then uh, our timeshare partner, Hilton Grand Vacation. And our two newest brands uh, that have developed uh, most recently, Motto and Tempo by Hilton, that are just uh, beginning to launch. Each one of our brands is, you know, has a, a, a very well-defined category and a niche uh, for that. It's a big differentiator uh, from us, from our competition, um, and really trying to make sure we have a wide range of uh, brands that support our various groups and uh, stay occasions that exist. You know, for 100 years now, um, actually 101 years now, Conrad Hilton uh, first founded uh, his first, uh, launched his first hotel in Cisco, Texas, um, uh, just over 100 years ago now. Um, and it was really, you know, Hilton has been built on uh, a vision of filling the earth with the light and warmth of hospitality. And, uh, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't take, you know, kind of a quick pause. Um, you know, we've all um, seen the um, various, uh, you know, um, uh, injustices that have happened uh, around uh, the U.S. over the last um, few months. And Hilton, just like every other company, um, has had an opportunity to really, um, you know, stand forward um, to uh, to speak about uh, these injustices, to acknowledge them, um, and to take an opportunity to have candid and transparent discussions with our teams. Uh, and and when you have a company that's built on a vision of light and warmth of hospitality. Um, it's a clear opportunity to really step forward in those conversations and um, to acknowledge uh, the, the pain, um, uh, the injustices that are happening, um, especially with um, some of our, our, our Black colleagues and, and, and um, our Black customers, and do the things that we can to help um, you know, step forward into that conversation. Uh, for many years, we've had a focus of being a great place to work, and not just a great place to work period, but a great place to work for all. Um, we hosted a session with Michael Bush, who's the CEO um, of the Great Place Work Institute last week, along with our CEO, Chris Nassetta, um, and really had a great dialogue uh, about um, you know, what it means to be a truly great place to work for all. Um, as was mentioned, I serve on uh, the board for the National Organization on Disability. Uh, and we know that those that are disabled are still underserved in the work uh, place today. And Hilton's um, had a tremendous focus on being a great place to work for all, regardless of gender, of race, uh, of origin, of ability, et cetera. Um, and so I just, I sort of pause on this for you know, two reasons. One is it is the core of who we are as a company. It is the core of hospitality in general. Um, and, uh, and, it's, and it's a reality of what we're you know, going through as a, as a nation uh, today. Um, and it's something that deserves the time and discussion. Uh, and, and corporate America has, a, uh, has an opportunity to step forward. And, uh, and I'm for one proud of, of the things that we're doing at Hilton. Um, we've got a long way to go like everybody else, but we have a clear focus on uh, being a great place to work for all and allowing our vision and our values um, to lead us through these discussions. I mentioned uh, the Great Place to Work Institute, Michael Bush. Um, Hilton has been recognized for the last two years as the number one uh, Fortune 100 best companies to work for. Um, and as, as Michael's highlighted is because of that focus of a great place to work for all. One of the things that they do is they, they look at the, the um, rankings based on different demographics. And they often see that, um, that companies have really high rankings but as they break down some of the demographics, they find that there is a group of have and have nots. And, and we've uh, been really focused on uh, you know, making sure that our culture is, is something that is a great place to work for all that is recognized around the world. Um, and across the globe, we have many of our, our locations are recognized as number one in their countries. And as a whole, Hilton's recognized as a, the best place to work, uh, the second best, uh, number two ranking for the world. Uh, we've also been uh, recognized as um, 
the best workplace for millennials. Uh, and this may be, you know, of interest to, to, to this group. Uh, we, uh, we have, um, uh, in, in the last couple of years, hired uh, more than 14,000 new millennial team members. Um, over a third of our team members in the U.S. are millennials, and, and globally, 57% of our uh, team members are millennials. So we recognize uh, this group and, and continue to do the things that we can to bring up the next generations of leaders and, uh, and, and hospitality leaders. So I wanted to just set a little bit of context around Hilton. Um, our mission, our vision, our values, the things that um, we've been focused on. Uh, and obviously the, you know, the pandemic um, has created a lot of challenges. But one of the things that uh, has helped us survive is that strong foundation. Number one, having amazing team members uh, that are willing to go above and beyond and, and, and work uh, everything they can to help through this, as well as having a solid foundation um, and, a, and a solid uh, vision and set of values and, and a mission that, um, that is, you're able to use as sort of your North Star and your, your shining light as you're navigating through a, a pandemic. The other thing that's very important for us um, is, and has always been, uh, this focus on our customer. Um, Hilton is a pioneering company, as I've mentioned, for the last hundred years, uh, we have been focused on innovating for our guests and for our customers. Uh, whether that's the first hotel in Cisco, Texas, the first airport hotel, having the first air conditioning rooms, uh, the first TV in rooms, all of these were first, uh, including uh, creating the pina colada. Um, you know, these, these were all first for Hilton uh, and Hilton properties. And, uh, and, and that innovation has helped us even in the pandemic. Um, you know, I always, you know, sort of like to pause and, and talk about what innovation is. Um, and, you know, innovation, you know, is essentially consistently delivering new sources of value to our customers. And so what do we mean by value, right? We mean unsolved problems, um, needs, or opportunities, which often leads us to delighting customers with new ways of doing things, um, making them capable of things they haven't been capable of, of before, uh, or removing something painful that uh, they have to do all the time. And so, you know, these best innovations, they change our customers' lives. Um, and we recognize it's difficult. And again, some of the innovations that we've been focused on over the last couple of year um, is, uh, are things that in the, in the middle of the pandemic have become uh, very ad advantageous for us. So let me talk about a couple of those. Um, we, we started many years ago with this real focus on our Hilton app and allowing it to be um, you know, literally your portal to everything that you want to do. Uh, we created a, a, a product that we call Connected Room that allows you to control TVs, lights, thermostat, um, order items ahead of time. Uh, we were the first to offer digital key and still the only to offer digital key at scale that allows you to digitally check in and use your phone as your digital key. Um, and also do room selection, um, choose your room, pin your favorite room, so you can imagine, you know, pre-pandemic, um, you know, these things, uh, you know, technology was changing the way we live, right? We, we all were living in our mobile devices. Uh, now we're literally all, almost uh, all day long living uh, within these digital assets. Uh, but, but being, uh, you know, focused on these areas um, were things that were important to us. And I'll, I'll show you a little, you know, snippet of a video um, that again was sort of pre-pandemic and, and uh, you know, sort of how digital key looked to our, our guests and our customers. So, you know, when we were, you know, pre-pandemic, this was something that our guests were asking us for. Um, you know, nobody wanted to have to stop by the front desk and present their credit card and their driver's license, the ability to check in online, choose your room that you wanted and go straight to your room was, you know, was something our customers were telling us they wanted. Well, you imagine now in a, um, in a contactless world, digital key and connected room really became the centerpiece of what we needed to do as a, um, as a hotel chain in order to be able to serve our guests. 
no longer was it safe to be interacting uh, with folks. And, and people were asking us, I want ways to have contactless check-in, contactless entry. And so we, we really took an opportunity to sort of lean into this space. Um, number one, we partnered with the Mayo Clinic and Lysol. Uh, we ultimately rolled out a program that we call Clean Stay. Uh, and, and by partnering with Mayo Clinic and by partnering with Lysol, we were able to sort of recognize what are that, that guests are expecting uh, in terms of a safe stay. What is it that they need in terms of sort of contactless entry? What are ways that we can help ensure their safety by, uh, by sanitizing rooms, making sure they're sealed and nobody entering beforehand? Um, and so we ultimately came up with the Clean Stay program. And I'll, I'll show you another quick video uh, that, um, uh, that is focused on Clean Stay. And again, you'll see some of those digital uh, components that we worked on that we had pre-pandemic and now all of a sudden how they were becoming the center uh, of our clean state program. So let me flip to this video now quickly. So again, even in the middle of a pandemic, um, you know, it was important to us to continue to focus on um, what are the things that we can do to innovate on behalf of our guests. And some of those were taking things like digital key and, and connected room that, uh, that had been needs and, and requests of our guests beforehand. Uh, and some of them were leaning into spaces that, um, you know, such as the partnership with Lysol a Mayo Clinic that really allowed us to create a clean state program that allowed people to feel comfortable coming back into a hotel. Um, and, uh, you know, at the lowest of our pandemic, um, we, saw, uh, we saw our occupancies on a global basis drop into the low teens, 12 and 13% occupancy. Um, just to put that in perspective, we normally run um, on average around 76, 77% occupancy. Uh, and so, you know, to, to drop to 12% occupancy obviously has a huge implication um, on, on our business and our, and our company. Um, you know, we're now back in, uh, you know, sort of regularly running in the 50% occupancies. Um, we were mentioning before the call started, some of our properties, um, especially around Labor Day, we're back into the 80, 90, and 100% occupancies as a, as a company. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, weekend performance in the 60% occupancy. Um, so still not where we were beforehand, um, but still much, much better than we were when we were at sort of the earliest steps of this and in, in the lockdown periods. Um, so again, we've continued to focus on our mission and our vision, um, spreading the light and warmth of hospitality, understanding how um, we can make that message relevant during uh, times of social injustice and, and, uh, and be there for our team members and our guests through those time periods as well as um, how we continue to keep that focus on our guests um, and the guest experience and our customers uh, to really um, highlight uh, things that we can do to, to um, uh, you know, um, accentuate their safety and the ability to come back into um, Hilton and uh, travel when the time is right for them and everybody's gonna have different travel needs and uh, different travel requirements. So I wanted to also just take a little bit of an opportunity to talk about um, you know, career opportunities. And I know um, right now it's a challenge for many companies. We like others have had to you know, deal with furloughs and, and layoffs um, as we write ship. But 
we will travel again as, as vaccines become available, as, um, uh, as, uh, as the pandemic, um, you know, uh, eventually uh, uh, moves forward, then we will we'll see people traveling again. And, and um, you guys are in the phases of, of your education where you're going to begin to think about what are the career opportunities for you? And I'll be honest, when I was at Baylor, I don't know that I ever thought about hospitality as a career. Uh, but as I've really gotten into Hilton for the last five years and understood more uh, about the opportunities that exist, what I realized is just about every job that you can imagine and every sort of career that you can imagine exists within the hospitality landscape. Um, and that's everywhere from, you know, architecture and design. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, the 18 brands we have, but also the brands um, that we are launching, uh, as well as the hotels that we're opening um, and, and continuing to open, uh, you know, engineering, we've got software and de uh, app development, uh, revenue management and marketing, culinary roles, legal roles, finance roles, you know, sales and business development. And so just about everything that, you know, you can imagine as a career choice exists within the hospitality landscape. Um, and, you know, with companies like Hilton that, as I mentioned earlier, in 118 uh, countries and territories around the globe, it's an opportunity to have a truly global career, uh, one that can take you to anywhere in the world that you want to go, um, that can create endless career paths for you, both, uh, you know, sort of vertically in that traditional career path that I start, you know, in one level and sort of move up, but also what I've learned in my career and have done, you know, through moving from financial services into, um, you know, retail and technology into hospitality is uh, also having that breadth of skills and being able to, uh, to learn different things is, is really important. And, uh, and Hilton provides that opportunity. Um, I, I would encourage you, you know, probably like most companies to get um, connected with Hilton Careers. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, YouTube, any of the social channels that uh, you're in today. Um, Hilton Careers is as well. Um, and it's a great opportunity just to follow some of the things and, and, get, and maybe it'll spark some ideas or some interest. Maybe some of you are already thinking about the hospitality industry. Uh, maybe you've got you know, parents or family or friends uh, that have uh, been in this industry and it's, it's something of interest to you. And maybe some of you are just beginning to explore um, different opportunities and this is something new. Um, our, our various social channels will often follow different jobs and roles, um, careers um, crossing different countries and just give you a real taste for um, the things that, uh, that are out there. So I just wanted to sort of end my, you know, sort of portion um, uh, talking just a little bit about leadership. Um, and uh, in the middle of a pandemic, I, I feel like this is a, you know, as important a conversation as it's ever been. Um, you know, I've mentioned a little of the opportunities that corporate America has had and Hilton has stepped into with some of the things going on in our nation. Um, and each one of you are developing leaders uh, that, that are going to be helping to, you know, shape uh, the, the future of our world. And I hope you um, are taking the opportunity to recognize that. Um, I know you, it may not feel real yet, but the things that you're doing today, the involvement that you're having with your various organizations, with your classes, with your classmates, are shaping the leader that, um, uh, that you'll be in the future. And one of the things that I've really learned over my career is that um, one of the greatest aspects of leadership is altering worldviews. Um, each one of us comes in with a unique set of perspectives. And, um, and those are based on our background and our history and our, our uh, growing up and the schools and things that we've been a part of. Um, but you know, being open to different worldviews and, and to listening um, requires trust. And trust comes from being an authentic leader. I've had um, the great opportunity in my career, you know, most recently with Chris Massetta, who's the CEO uh, of Hilton, to um, and and really working back through you know early days of Rich Fairbank and, and Jeff Bezos, of having some truly authentic leaders um, as the CEO of companies that I've been a part of, and um, and really finding out uh, from them you know key leadership. And I remember early in my career, Rich Fairbank, who's the still founder and CEO of, of Capital One. You know, shared, um, you know, often in leadership, you're sort of striving for that next promotion. You're trying to get to the next level. Um, and, and Rich's feedback was always, you know, find out what you're passionate about. Uh, find out what really matters to you. 
And if you find those things, then you'll find your leadership voice because you'll care about it and, uh, and you'll be able to go for it. Uh, too often people, I think, try to step into leadership and they want it to be a, well, you're given this position and um, you know, it's sort of a granted uh, versus an earned. And so a couple of the things that I would just share with you from my own you know, personal leadership values and, and things that I've found is number one, as I was mentioning, discover what matters to you. Um, uh, in doing so, find your voice. And that can be you know, in all different shapes and forms. It could be with maybe your roommate, um, you know, maybe a, a group within your dorm. It could be within social clubs that you're part of. It could be within your classrooms. Uh, but begin to find you know, what matters to you and, and to begin to find your leadership voice. And then ultimately decide to lead. Um, it is a decision. Um, and again, leadership comes in all forms. It's, it can be in informal leaderships. So you may be an officer in a club or organization, or it can be an informal leadership. And, and this will show up in uh, group projects and group events you do. And finally, uh, connect with others. Uh, you're in uh, um, uh, a time and a, and a place where you have an opportunity to interact with individuals, socially distanced and, uh, and mostly virtual at this point. Um, but with others that come from different backgrounds, different worldviews, um, different perspectives, and it's an opportunity to listen and to learn um, and to shape what will ultimately be your leadership uh, style as you go forward. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's what's needed. Um, and, uh, and what I think Baylor does an amazing job um, of creating uh, the right Christian atmosphere uh, for all of our students, but one that is also focused on uh, an inclusive nature. Um, and understanding that we all have different uh, perspectives. Uh, I think Dr. Livingstone has done a phenomenal job in the culture that she's created at Baylor. Um, and I think uh, the leadership that, uh, that she and, and other leaders at Baylor have shown, even through this pandemic, has been phenomenal. Um, and, and I couldn't be more prouder to you know, be an alumni at Baylor, um, to spend a little bit of time with you guys today and sharing some of the things that uh, have gone on in my life, have, uh, in, in my career, that are currently going on with Hilton and, and a few just you know, closing thoughts on leadership, things that uh, hopefully you can begin to use to, uh, to shape your future uh, and your career going forward. So with that, I'd love to open it up to questions. I'd love to, I am open book, talk about anything uh, from my time at Baylor to my various career stops to things that are going on at Hilton, whatever is top of mind to you and you guys are curious about, I'd love to engage with you on. All right, I know you touched on this a little bit, but um, Charles had a question. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask that, Charles? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be here today. Does Hilton offer international opportunities to American workers? Part of me really wants to go work abroad. Absolutely. Um, we yes, we definitely do. And and as I as as was mentioned, I did touch on a little bit. You know, in 118 countries with 6,000 properties around the world, um, we have a lot of opportunities um, for uh, for people to to travel all over the uh, you know the country and the world. Um, and and that is you know one of the things that I think is um, is advantageous about you know being a truly global company. Um, so as you sort of engage with us and as you engage within our career site, um, you'll start to see some of those various opportunities that exist in locations and locations um, and you can inquire more. So Mike, obviously you have the travel bug. Your family took a year off um, to, to go travel. Uh, so have you had an opportunity to travel with your career? I have. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I grew up, uh, as I mentioned, in Arkansas. My, uh, my parents were in the hospital business. My dad was a hospital administrator. My mom was a, um, was a x-ray tech. And, and I sort of developed that travel bug very early uh, with mostly domestic travel. Um, and back in the days of sort of the Holiday Inn and the Best Western, where you'd sort of drive from town to town and You'd be looking for the vacancy not to have no lit up on the front of it uh, and that was sort of where you would end up staying and uh, you know this is back before you know really central <laughs> reservation the digital uh, you know uh, capabilities existed um, and uh, and you know I think the combination of my parents being in the healthcare field um, a lot of similarities uh, you know to hospitality the the empathy and care for others um, and, and ultimately, uh, that, that passion for travel that came from a lot of domestic travel with, uh, with my family. 
And over the years, um, I've had an opportunity. Um, I, all of my um, locations that I've been that I've worked have been domestic. Um, so I've I've worked between Dallas, uh, Georgia, or lived between Dallas, Georgia, um, Seattle, and uh, and then now back in the Dallas area again. But I've had an opportunity to travel extensively. Um, really, starting with my time at Amazon, uh, I uh, one of my roles was leading our international operations. So I had offices in um, San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and Hyderabad, uh, Hyderabad, India. Um, and so I was regularly um, spending time in each one of those locations. And then, uh, and then as I've joined Hilton, I have a global team. And so I've got offices everywhere from um, Shanghai, uh, you know, China, uh, Tokyo, Japan, um, Singapore and Glasgow, Scotland, um, in Mexico City, um, and throughout the U.S. Um, and so uh, I've had an opportunity to travel um, to a lot of uh, of countries and locations with uh, with Hilton. Um, and probably the hardest thing for the pandemic, um, I was somebody that traveled two to three weeks every month, um, and uh, and uh, I've had very minimal travel um, since all of this happened. And so. That's probably been one of the hardest things for me is to not uh, be with our teams, interacting, being in our hotels, um, uh, and and uh, and having those experiences. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Jackson Woodruff has a question. Uh, has a couple of questions for you, Jackson. Hello, thanks for talking today. Uh, I was wondering what it was like transitioning from the world of finance into the world of customer relations and hospitality. And uh, were there any new skills that you needed to learn for that? Or uh, were you already pretty well set from your previous experiences? Hey, Jackson, good to see you. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I sort of touched on this a little bit, but let me um, expand out on a little bit more. I have always tried to, um, you know, sort of take different roles that, that allowed me and, you know, caused me to change some of the skill sets. So when I think about some of the foundational skill sets, even that I learned at Baylor, um, you know, some of the foundational uh, um, uh, leadership uh, capabilities that came even just from serving as an officer within my fraternity when I was there, um, all the way to, um, you know, some of the class, you know, roles that I had. Um, also, I, I don't think I touched on this early in my career or early in my um, life. Music was very important to me. Um, and I was in, you know, band and, and choir. And, and that was, you know, an area where you learned a lot about, you know, team and working together and, and you know, sort of leadership. Um, and then obviously, you know, from a financial perspective, uh, you know, some of the foundational things that I learned at Baylor and I began to practice early days at Capital One. Um, but I, I moved roles um, quite a bit, whether that was, you know, in sort of an operations leadership role or a financial analyst role um, and, and across industries. And each step along the way, I was constantly looking to what I sort of say, add to my tool belt. Um, so what are things that I could learn from? And, it, and if I, you know, sort of summarize some of those when I was at Capital One, you know, Capital One was very much an entrepreneurial data-based uh, company. And so I learned a lot about, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, mass customization, uh, data uh, importance, uh, but also leadership. Uh, Rich Fairbank was um, a, a CEO and a leader that was very focused on uh, team dynamics and leadership. And I learned those things. And when I, when I moved to Amazon, uh, I always say, I feel like I got my doctorate degree in customer, uh, you know, from Jeff and team there, because obviously, you know, it's been well documented and, you know, plenty of, of books and articles you can read about Amazon's experience. But without a doubt, Jeff believes and, and full heartedly supports, you know, the, the focus on the customer, um, the focus on long term and innovating. Uh, and um, and so there were some some things that I was able to bring from a leadership perspective, um, data and technology understanding, but really, you know, learn a lot there around customer and long term um, focus. And then ultimately bring those to Hilton. And I had a lot to learn and, and I'm still learning about the hospitality industry, the hotel industry, where franchise model, what it means to run a franchise business, but was able to bring the things that I had learned um, you know, from, uh, from Hilton and, uh, I'm sorry, from uh, Amazon and from Capital One and, and all the way back to my time at Baylor. So I consider myself a lifelong learner. I always try to learn new and different things, um, put myself in situations that 
um, that take advantage of the skill sets and, and the, the capabilities that I've developed and learned over time, but also help me to learn new things and uh, you know continue to evolve both as a person and as a leader. Uh, we have a question from another Jackson. Um, he's listed as Jackson's iPhone. Yeah, that's how we're all doing today. Um, I was just wondering about, um, we hear all the time about how important networking is coming out of college. And I didn't know, like, you as an employer, how important is it to y'all, especially seeing as how you work for, like, one of the largest companies in the world, um, especially coming up fresh out of college. Yeah, look, I think I think networking um, is always important, right? I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, we're, you know, we are trying to create connections and networks of people, hence some of the, you know, even the social um, networks that I was sharing and being able to, um, you know, have access to the best talent that's out there. Um, and, um, you know, what I found is the most valuable about networks is really helping you understand what opportunities exist. Um, you know, what, what I, you know, sort of encourage people today is, you know, if I, I think about, you know, I mentioned my, my experience with, you know, Capital One. Um, I, you know, went to the Career Services Center back then. It was probably a paper list of who was coming to recruit. The internet was nascent at the time. You know, there was probably a little bit of research, but most of what you found out about the company at the time was when they came on campus and they did their presentation. Um, and you were sort of learning about them for the first time. And, and I, you know, sort of fell in love with Capital One and had the opportunity, you know, ultimately to join them. Um, but today you've got tremendous amount of information at your fingertips, right? Whether that's, um, you know, uh, you know, going through LinkedIn, uh, whether that's, um, you know, on the career side of any individual company that you may be interested in to resources like Glassdoor um, that help aggregate information from employees of companies and provide rankings and, and information to them. So I think information is important and, and your network can be there. Um, and Baylor's got an amazing alumni network. Um, I'm out on LinkedIn, I'm happy to connect with anyone and, and talk to anyone about their career after the last class I spoke to. I had a number of people reach out to me and had some conversations with some folks um, and so uh, happy to help, um, you know, people that are trying to understand what they may be interested in, what their uh, career passions may be around and how that may lead to, you know, your, your first job uh, out of school. All right. Uh, Cody has a question, but his mic isn't working. So um, who is Hilton's biggest competitor and how does Hilton deal with them? Hey, Cody, that's a that's an interesting question. And, you know, and it's one that I think um, probably like many companies, it's it's an evolving answer. Um, yeah, so I'll sort of answer it on a couple of different dimensions. Number one is, uh, you know, you can define competitor in more of the traditional space. Um, and so you would have companies like Marriott uh, and Marriott um, being their size would be, you know, what many people would deem as one of the primary competitors to Hilton. Um, you've also got evolving, you know, competitors and in, in, uh, in ancillary spaces. So think about the sharing economy, um, and you think about Airbnb and VRBO, um, and and companies such as that 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 have um, uh, alternative, uh, you know, locations for people. Uh, and then you can also think about, um, uh, you know, companies such as uh, Google or Amazon who control search and uh, where companies, you know, where people go to search and the impact that that has um, on, on companies. And I think for us, uh, it goes back to a slide I showed earlier, which is, you know, is the focus on the customer. Um, it's really easy to get focused on competitors and sort of chase after them. Um, but if you get really focused on your customer and, you know, what's important to you, uh, then um, it really allows you to have the right focus. Uh, one of my favorite comments that Jeff Bezos used to make. And, and um, he was on stage one day and he got asked a question. He said, uh, you know, Jeff, you, you've sort of navigated lots of different changes in the world and, and Amazon's continued to evolve. You know, what's the next big change going to be? What's, what's the next big thing that Amazon's, you know, going to chase after? And Jeff said, you know, it's a great question. I get that question asked a lot. He goes, the question I often don't get asked is what's not going to change. And if you can focus on what's not going to change, you can build a company that's durable. And for Amazon, right, that was all about low price, convenience, and selection. And Jeff knew that those things would never change. And even as they've gone into various industries, including, you know, AWS and web service, you know, if you focus on, you know, sort of low price, convenience, and selection, you can really build a business model around that. And as 
different um, customer expectations change, you can you know layer them into that. And I think that's very true for Hilton, right? For a hundred years, we've had a focus on uh, you know a core mission of spreading the light and warmth of hospitality, being customer centric, and constantly innovating for our customers. And so while we're very aware of our competitors and, and we continue to monitor the landscape, uh, we continue to stay very focused on what's important to our customers, building for our customers and staying true to our values um, and allowing that not to distract us. And it's been successful for Hilton for a hundred years. Um, I feel confident it's helped us navigate the, the pandemic because we didn't have a lot of things that were distracting our focus. Uh, and I feel confident that it'll carry us forward uh, as well. Okay, uh, Joseph Crump has his hand raised. So Joseph, if you'll unmute. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for speaking to us. Um, so you've talked a little bit about leadership, data, and data and technology, as well as customers and how to deal with them uh, adequately. But what are some skills that you would say are hard uh, to acquire along the way getting to the point that you are now? It's a great question, Joseph. I, you know, the, 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 the way I think about that is um, as it relates to, you know, sort of leadership and, you know, if, if you will, you know, sort of traditional management path, I think there's a lot of skills that you can sort of read about in textbook, you know, an accounting principle or practice, um, you know, finance, marketing, et cetera, um, that, are, that are practices that you can sort of implement. But the interaction with you know, human beings brings a very different dynamic in, in place. And for me, I feel like that's been you know, a lifelong journey of, of continuing to um, try to be, you know, to listen, um, even back to the customer or the question, you know, Charles asked at the very beginning around you know, working in different locations and international, um, you start to recognize that the things that you may hold true as worldviews may be very different in a different part of the region based on um, you know, uh, the various characteristics of that, that location. Um, and so to me, the, the hardest skill set to really, you know, um, you know, you'll never perfect it is that around leadership. And, and it's, it's a lifelong journey of being open, listening, engaging um, with individuals. And, I, and, and look, there's, you know, a tremendous amount of, of hard skills um, that are out there and, you know, you see a lot evolving in, um, you know, in the engineering space today and you see AI and, and uh, you know, sort of machine learning developing and things that people can really focus on with core skills. Uh, but I think that, you know, sort of emotional intelligence, um, the leadership, the interacting with people is one of those skills that you're never, ever finished learning because there will always be something else that will evolve and um, and uh, and one of the skill sets that's most needed uh, in companies today. Okay, Abby Bush. Her mic might not be working. Hi. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. There we are. Sorry <laughs> about that. So I was just wondering, what do the entry level positions at Hilton look like? So we have um, lots of different entry level positions, and I probably should have even started with, um, you know, internships uh, that that we offer at Hilton. And, and again, these can be everywhere from, you know, marketing internships, um, revenue management internships, or or entry level positions. Um, that uh, all the way to on-property um, experiences, whether that's working in, you know, the front office, um, you know, working, you know, reception, uh, you know, to working, you know, back office and, and heart, what we would call heart of house, you know, catering or, um, you know, restaurant or things of that nature. So, you know, it really is, if you can think about just about any position um, that's available, we have those. Um, and, and even, you know, within my organization, we've had uh, a number of positions that we've hired over the last few years. Um, and some are entry level leadership positions, uh, management positions. And I know for me, um, that was one of the things I started off, uh, you know, right out at Capital One and, and I was managing people. And I remember on day one sort of walking in and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And the team was all looking at me like, you're some 20 something year old kid. Why are you here trying to lead me? Um, and it was it was a challenge for all of us um, in those early days, but it was one that, um, in hindsight, I look back on it and I was glad I made that step and that I sort of put myself in a position to be a little bit uncomfortable. 
because I think it, it helped set my career off. And so, you know, what I would ultimately sort of encourage each of you as you're looking at entry level positions is, you know, really focus on what you're trying to ultimately develop as a career. Um, there's lots of jobs that will sound really good on paper um, or the organization may sound great on paper. But as you get into it, you realize you're just serving someone else. Um, you're doing all their legwork, um, all their grunt work, the things that they don't want to do. And it may or may not be a, you know, advancing your career the way you want to. Um, and there's other roles that may not necessarily sound you know, as sexy you know, out of the gate, but all of a sudden you realize it's developing a core set of skills, you know, maybe a leadership skill or capability that will benefit you down the road. Um, and so I just encourage, you know, much like we're talking about with leadership, you know, discover what matters to you, what you're passionate about, and try to match those things up. Because in my experience, when you match those things, you will have your most um, success. And success is what's going to create options, um, you know, for you as you go down the road. All right, Azat Zawatsky, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Are you still out there? Yeah, I was just curious how closely you worked with Jeff Bezos when you were at Amazon. So I would, um, I would probably interact with him a couple of times a year, um, mostly in um, sort of planning sessions and um, executive budgets. Um, and, uh, but you know, Jeff, Jeff is one of those leaders that um, is, uh, is you know, pretty transparent. Um, uh, he uh, you know, has a couple of key focus areas. If you go back to you know sort of reading his initial shareholder letter that he wrote um you know at the very beginning of amazon the, the guiding principles are still just as true today as they were back then and so um uh he, you know he was an amazing leader to be able to learn from and observe uh in the interactions and there's a lot of other great leaders um, including folks like jeff wilkie um, who is the ceo of amazon that just announced his upcoming retirement um, that, uh, that, you know, really taught a lot and, and continued that message around customer centricity and thinking long-term and innovation. That's, that's so important at Amazon. All right, we're running out of time, but we'll um, take time for a couple more questions. So Luke Thompson, are you out there? Let me see if I can find his question again. Luke asked, when you were talking about hiring millennials, what's the reasoning behind hiring this group, um, especially since they're younger? I feel like experience would be a strong quality in regards to hospitality. Yeah, well, look, I think, I think there's two dynamics in play. Number one is it's, it's who's in the job market today. Um, it is, you know, the, the millennials uh, and, 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 you know, the emerging, you know, young leaders that are out there are, are who's in the market today. And as I mentioned, you know, at the, at the beginning, right, we're, we're looking to be a great place to work for all. And while there's definitely some roles that um, experience is important, um, at the size and scale that we are, we need, um, you know, we need all levels. Um, and, and we need, you know, sort of all experience levels. And we need to be, you know, focusing on developing those next set of leaders. And so we're, you know, very much making sure that we're a great place, as I said, to work for all, um, regardless of age, you know, race, gender, origin, et cetera. Um, and millennials uh, are a large, you know, population. They're a large entrant into the workforce over the last couple of years, and um, and just like you know every other demographic, one that we want to make sure we're adapting our workforce to and supporting uh, in their career growth and development. All right, and I think this will be our last question. Um, I'm sorry for those questions that we didn't get to, but Mary Sanchez. Hi. Yes. Um... Thank you so much for coming to speak with us, but I was also just wanting to ask about um, family life and balancing that with work. I mean, like what point in your career did you feel that you could um, be able to balance both and begin and start your family? Yeah, Mary, it's a great question. And, um, you know, for me, I, I would say it was probably around the time that we took our family sabbatical when I really became um, maybe most aware uh, of the importance of, of uh, work-life balance, um, or as I like to call it, work-life harmony. Um, I, I think, you know, balance implies sort of a trade-off of you have to give up on one to get the other. Um, and to me, I, I like this concept of harmony a little bit better that 
um, is, is supporting both of them. And, you know, at the time I had young kids, Austin was two and Abby was five. I was, um, I had been gone for basically 15 months um, traveling nonstop. And I realized that I was, you know, not doing the things that in my mind were the priorities, right, of, of harmonization. And so um, as, as awkward as it was to sort of step, take a step out in my career. And at that point I had, I had just, uh, I think I'd just gotten my first executive level promotion and promoted to VP at, at uh, Capital One. And, you know, you could sort of argue you're sort of on that career trajectory that you want to be on. But I realized that I was not in harmony from a, a personal life. And so, you know, we spent time reconnecting and traveling as a family, something that was important to us and, and et cetera. And ever since then, I've just tried to have the balance, um, you know, the, the, the harmony between those two. Um, and, and tried to make sure that I always put things first. And um, and I think it's, you know, it's an important aspect. I, I, I think, you know, again, there's a lot of us are looking for what are the silver linings that are gonna come out of uh, this pandemic. And as I mentioned, for somebody who's traveling, uh, you know, typically two to three weeks out of the year um, to have been home nonstop uh, with the family, having dinner, you know, multiple nights. Although as my daughter and son have reminded me a couple of times, like we're done with that dad, can you go back to traveling again? So. Um, you know, too much of a good thing, I guess, but um, <laughs> uh, I think it's important. And even, you know, we were talking about this before. I mean, my dog's sitting in my feed. She's, you know, sort of shaken a couple of times. You may have heard her call her. Um, you know, I, I've been uh, very much, you know, yesterday was an example of I had a meeting and I said, hey, I got to go early because I've got to get my son to a baseball practice. Um, and, uh, and, and I think this has really helped all of us get more comfortable um, declaring that balance. And so I, I hope that this is one of the positives that truly comes out of this. Um, that people feel more comfortable. Yeah, we'll still be in offices, we'll still travel, uh, but it's also okay to declare the boundaries uh, more, uh, maybe even overtly than we did in the past. All right, so um, I think we're gonna bring that to a close then. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thank you to the students as well for all of your wonderful questions. Um, if you look through your group chat, you'll see more questions and lots of thank yous for you, Mike. Um, we really appreciate your time uh, today to talk with us and, and uh, share your wisdom and um, this was wonderful. So uh, just remind the students, um, you do have homework due on Thursday, so don't forget that. Um, but thank you so much, Mike. Thanks to each and one of you. Um, really appreciate being with you. Thanks for the great questions today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me um, uh, if you'd like. And, uh, happy to help support you in any way I can and continue having a great semester. I know it's a different one, but uh, you guys are doing great uh, in navigating uh, the new territory. I'm excited for all of you and your careers ahead of you and uh, uh, keep doing your thing. Sick and bears. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm trying to stop our recording. There we go.